All right, uh, welcome to the practical bit here. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I have a list of things for you to do. I'm going to do uh, some basic experiments with you already, and then I'm going to let you uh, do a few things in groups. Um, for today's practical, we're going to be using an SPL meter. I've got one here, and there are uh, three more with Lucas and Rich. And everyone will also need to take a tape measure. Okay, so two things for today's practical, SPL meter and tape measure, once we're done with these bits. Um, it's kind of loose, having fun, uh, discovering things on your own. That's the point here. So <coughs> here is the plan, approximately, uh, which is, get rid of this. So first thing, we're going to listen to correlated and uncorrelated white noise and sine waves to determine how the listening position changes the spectral characteristic. Okay, so uh, in order to do this, what I'll, uh, what I'll do is I'm gonna be using max MSP. Let me hear you say yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I could be using super collider, which would be my weapon of choice, but I guess it's useful if we uh, use something that is more widely appreciated, understood, and all the rest. So, uh, again, correlated and uncorrelated white noise. Okay, so there is a crucial difference, which you will uh, hopefully hear quite well, between using a single noise generator and sending it to two speakers, uh, which I'm about to do now. If I don't get horribly stuck with all of this, uh, so we have a speaker object, okay, and in this case, oh, thank you, so you won't have to go and get it, uh, you'll have it here. You have a sheet of paper, so they sign? No. Please bring a pen as well, because I don't have any. Uh, okay. uh, just a pen, so they can sign it. Uh, cool, so this is uh, white noise, I just have to make sure uh, that we all hear it. If I can get out of this trap here. Hello. Okay. So, I don't know, you probably guys are aware that uh, it's two audio drivers at this stage. So, I have to select it here. I'm using the external headphones. Well, we can't see the lights. Oh, you can't even see it, yeah. which is horrible. Because I just did the screen doubling okay the that's what i just did you see okay. it's just that yeah that's what happens i forgot it. typically when you start the powerpoint presentation it overrides what you've just done which is not necessarily desirable and now the system preferences are here okay <laughs> except system preferences show all <laughs> show all preferences which are now here excellent yeah I may not start the PowerPoint presentation that's the, that's the problem <laughs> okay so back to max MSP uh, so I have a noise and I have <laughs> put this on two speakers okay now that's uh, uh, we have to pan it left, right, that's right, that's left. Okay, so I have the same noise source panned left and right. Now, what I'll ask you to do is stand up and walk around the room and observe whether you hear spectral differences. Everyone's got it? You kind of get the idea? Uh, come, come up front and walk back and forth here in front. That's the most obvious thing. Just like this, crossways. Uh, 
photo, maybe just a tiny bit less, but it's really, really loud. Oh yes, of course. Well, I'm deaf, you see. Yeah, you get it? Yeah. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use two noise sources and send them one channel each and now do the same thing. Okay. Not as apparent, right? It's quite apparent, would you agree? Like, I found that like the first one was more apparent while moving in the field. Mm. Is, it is, it that, is that correlated? Yeah, it has to do with correlation of the signals. So you, what you see here, that if you're just set there, so now I ask you to stay seated, and you listen to this, right? And compare that to uh, this. You can't, I suppose you can't really tell the difference, right? Mm -hmm. But if you move around the room, you can very well tell the difference between two scenarios, mm -hmm. okay? So this is everything to do with correlation in the sense that if I send a single sound source, a single noise generator to both speakers, these are fully correlated. Both speakers are emitting the exact same signal. So you probably know by now that white noise is kind of a random signal. Right? So if I have two noise generators, actually the, the values, the sample values generated are completely <coughs> different. They're statistically random and to our perception they are pretty much identical. We cannot tell the difference. Right? Also you cannot tell the difference if I play it now or if I play it a minute later. And between now and a minute later again you would have a completely different set of samples. Right? So it's the kind of signal which is essentially generated by random values. Right? And that's the point. You don't hear the difference between one set of random values and two sets of random values. But in the room, if the two signals are correlated, if it's the exact same signal coming from left and right, based on your position, you will get what? What did you hear? Someone said phasing. We have a more accurate term for this. Com filtering. Right? So if you remember from the lecture, it's the one that has all these dips. Okay? And then based on your position, these dips are moving. So when I said that you do not hear the difference between uh, <coughs> while you're seated between the two scenarios, that was a stretch. I was actually suggesting, I was priming you to nod your head because you might actually hear the difference, but it's not so apparent. It becomes really apparent when you move and thereby the comb notches move as well. Okay, make sense? So this raises a huge question. Why on earth do you put a mono snare sample in the middle? Right? If you have a mono snare sample in your production and you put the exact same thing left and right, what happens? This exact same thing. It's a similarly broadband signal, like white noise. So actually what you're creating is a situation where depending on the position of the listener you will get a slightly different timbre of your snare drum. And you may spend three years tuning it as well before you discover that, uh-oh, there's an issue. In fact, you probably never will discover it unless you come to the architectural acoustics class. So, what's the burning question here? Well, the burning question is what the hell can we do about our mono snare samples, right? How do we aid this? Well, if you're a bit of a linguist, you probably know the answer without knowing what it means. The answer is decorrelation. Okay, so we have many ways of producing decorrelation. There's some really advanced techniques as well. If you, I'm not sure it's actually published because it's kind of a trade secret, but Dolby Atmos, has a size parameter. Everyone knows what Dolby Atmos is, yeah. I reckon. So it has a size parameter. So on top of placing your sound source somewhere, 
what you can also do is you can set the size of it. Now when you set the size of it, what happens is that mono channel, which is typically what you get, right, will be panned to multiple speakers and decorrelated in relation to the original signal. And I was lucky enough to meet the guy who has come up with the amazing algorithm that does it. And I was also lucky enough to hear it in vivo and ask the guy to modulate it really fast, which would have been, uh, you know, uh, a good uh, sign of its quality, right? So if I, if I put a modulation on this size, right, and it's kind of spreading it out and narrowing it back down and spreading it out really fast, then you're most likely to hear an anomaly if the algorithm is flawed. And to my surprise, I have to admit, I heard no anomaly. The correlation works beautifully. And as far as I understood, it works with a really funny physical model of few springs and masses attached and totally complex stuff. Okay, so there are uh, state-of-the-art decorrelation algorithms out there doing the job. Uh, what's a poor man's decorrelation? Yes? Uh, I meant in the processing terms. With two different mics, actually, what you get is the same problem back again. Depending on the room, if the room is very diffuse, maybe not. But in a typical room, if you place two microphones, right, you would have to, well, you either create a stereo signal by re-recording the snare drum, if that's what you meant, but actually we're starting with a mono sample, right? So if I do this mono sample, play through a speaker, record it with two mics, right? I will get similar anomalies, potentially, right? So the poor man's decorrelation is a short reverb. Yeah, if you take a really short reverb, the way you do this is you kind of A-B test uh, your reverb, bypass on off, and you try to make it such that you don't hear a timbral difference, that it kind of sounds the same, but that there is a very short uh, reverberation there, you kind of got the decorrelation. Okay? So I invite you to try that. Okay, any questions, suggestions about this? Right? So that, that's really crucial, that's how things add up. Now, another thing that we could have done here uh, would have been to pay attention to the level which is kind of tricky because I'm pushing the faders up and down, but just uh, reflecting on it, what do you expect? Would there be a difference in level between correlated and uncorrelated summing? Yes. Namely? Um, I mean, like, it's twice the amplitude, right? When? When it's correlated. Yes, except where in, where in, in the, the room? Dips. In the In the central pane. Okay, so that's the point. If you're on the central pane here, then, central pane, <laughs> sounds like a good band, uh, <coughs> right? So you're there, it means that you will not have a spectral anomaly and all the, uh, both signals will be constructively interfering at all frequencies, okay? So uh, I could attempt to do that. There's people in the central pane. Okay, let's try this. So this is, I'm not going to touch the faders. So this level versus this level. Back again. Back again. Can you confirm? It's kind of a bit louder. Yeah, yeah? Slightly louder. you slightly, you hear it slightly louder. Okay, cool. So uh, thank you very much. So that's, that's the, the correlated, decorrelated noise. Okay, let's predict what would happen. That was actually the, the experiment that they showed me when I was a student of uh, music tech in Netherlands. We had one speaker on a trolley, right? So what would you, if, if I have a correlated noise on both speakers, the same source, and I move one speaker, what do you expect? So I have a uh, correlated noise, the same signal from two speakers, and I'm moving one of the speakers and you are seated in the same position. What do you expect? Yeah, same thing. Comp filter moving up and down. Okay? 
And it sounds even more surreal because you're kind of seated, right? If you move around, you sort of expect these things. Okay, so we can try the next one, although I'm not sure how uh, interested you are in walking around the room. But the next thing would be to figure out what happens to sine waves. But I'll be happy if we just predict it. If I play a sine wave, which is correlated, by the way, can I play uncorrelated sine waves of the same frequency? No. Th they, they, if the sine waves are of the same frequency, they may be different phase, but they're still correlated. Right? So what do you expect from moving around the room while the sine waves are playing? Do you hear filtering? How on earth do you hear filtering? There's no kind of response. Huh? Depending on the frequency of the generator, the sine wave will have no response. In some areas, you can hear it more or less. More or less what? Uh, intensity. Like Amplitude. Loudness. Amplitude, loudness. Okay? So that was the trick question here. Because you cannot really hear filtering of a sine wave. It's the same process as attenuating it. Right? If it's a single sine wave, it's either louder or softer. It might be that I actually have a filter which does other things to other frequencies, but I cannot perceive that because I only have a single sine wave. Okay? You want to walk around the room with the sine wave? <coughs> the nice things about uh, high frequency sine waves, other than uh, further comments on the, on the loudness probably, <laughs> is that it's typically sufficient for you to move just to rotate your head. Okay, so what you have seen, if you remember my interference pattern, the kind of flower thing, or uh, I don't know, any other visual <coughs> ideas there. So sunshine. what, excuse me? Sunshine, sunshine. yeah. Sunray. Yeah, sun rays. <coughs> uh, enlightenment, <laughs> Buddhism, yeah? <laughs> <coughs> so if you see my little mandala, whatever, uh, how does it, change if I lower the frequency? It's less directional in the areas Do I get more petals or less petals? Less, uh, less petals. Okay, that makes sense. Cool. You've got that. So the point is that if I have a very high frequency, I would have a lot of petals like that, which means that even a small movement of your head or even just the rotation should make a difference. Okay, what is the highest frequency you can bear without experiencing pain? Ooh. Okay, so if you just rotate your head a bit, you can probably get a few dips already. Who gets more dips? Guys who are seated closer or further away? Closer, exactly. Just remember the petals, right? Remember the graph. If you're closer, then a small movement gets you across multiple peaks and troughs, more so than if, if you're in the back. Okay? And what will happen if I have two different sign generators? First, the prediction. Probably nothing. That's the right question, answer, right? I mean, what can happen is that they can be out of phase, and initially you have a different level, right, depending on the phase, but the same phenomenon should occur that if you move around, you get changes in amplitude. Make sense? But isn't it like more so because there's like double the amplitude? No, it's the same amplitude. I mean, it's, it's just that if, if the two are out of phase, then you will have a peak elsewhere in the room, <coughs> right? So if I have the same sign generator, I am sure that the peak will be on axis, in the middle, pain. And if I have two separate oscillators, maybe they're slightly out of phase, and then it won't be in the middle, but it will be somewhere else. But in any case, now that I'm having a single frequency sine wave, the petals do their job, so to speak, so actually you will have ons and offs and uh, troughs and peaks across the room. Uh, okay? Because the frequency, because the, the speaker has a dispersion polar pattern as well. So it's going to be more directional than some frequency. Uh, yes, very, very good comment there. So we didn't really account for speakers' directivity. Yeah. 
and the refraction of the edges and all the rest of that. So we kind of assume this. But in any case, this phenomenon is more prominent than the anomalies coming from the speakers. Right? Uh, in fact, it's not, it's not just the speaker's off-axis response. It is off-axis response in combination with the reflections. Right? Because if there are no reflections, then the off-axis response doesn't do much. Right? So good point there. So what that, that's actually a really interesting uh, consideration. So how would this be different if we were in an anechoic situation with perfect speakers? Would the phenomenon be stronger or weaker? Stronger. <coughs> Why? Because there would be more aligned. There would be like less... Not the theory was... The assumption was that because it was a more controlled area, the phenomena where there would be more depth would be more pronounced because they're aligned. Yeah, because it's, it's exactly right. So the point is that if you have all the reflections, what do you expect? Well, they're slightly softer, right? But they are out of phase, totally. So they would kind of fill in the dips a bit more, right? So in an anechoic situation with perfect speakers, what would you expect? You would actually expect that there is positions where you don't even hear it, right? So there should be. How would you make sure that this happens? You probably also have to shut one of your ears, right? Because with two ears, you're kind of in two positions at the same time as well. Okay, so with one ear, anechoic situation, perfect speakers, theoretically you could find a null point where you don't even hear it. All right? Cool. That's great. What else do we've got? So that's, that was the demo and a uh, bit of fun. So now it's going to be up to you to do the bit. So what I have here is four kits. So I will ask you to gather into four groups. Uh, and uh, I'll just, uh, and everyone gets one leader who signs the sheet. Once you're done with it, just return it to Lucas and Rich and Isaac back in the room. So here is the rest of the kits. And for each one, I also have a tape measure. Okay, so there are four tape measures and four SPL meters. Uh, so it's a bit of a fun warm-up. We're going to have more, uh, you know, interesting and crucial practicals uh, in future weeks. Essentially, we're going to be doing everything with measurement microphones and fuzz measure and going to do interesting things. In fact, we are going to have six groups because we will have six kids from next week on. So this is a bit of a warm-up. I mean, it's not quite sunny anymore. I was thinking, you know, it'll be fun for you to run around. But I'm asking you to do the following things. And please, every group, have some evidence. Write down what you found. And next practical, we will start by looking at these findings. Okay? <coughs> so first thing, study the manual of the SPL meter. It's already on the blackboard, but you can also find it by looking at uh, the, uh, the serial number, not the serial number, the, the actual uh, meter itself. So I want you to briefly research the applications of A and C weighting curves. Okay, so that's one of the options that the SPL meter gives you. A weighting, C weighting. You probably heard these terms before. You've probably forgotten which one is what or what they do. So please uh, research this and figure out which one you want to use. Okay, that's the first thing. And kind of get to know the machine. Read the manual, RTFM. You know this one. Uh, then... What I would like you to do is determine the SPL using white noise from speakers at three distances. Okay, so th the basic thing there, if, if you have someone in the group who likes equations, please don't refrain from using them. But if you don't, uh, you know the rule of thumb? What was the rule of thumb? When do I get... Uh, uh, what, what happens when I double the distance? Yes, 6 dB drop, okay? So see if that works. And if it doesn't, think hard about why it doesn't, okay? And which way it doesn't, okay? So this will be your kind of practical thing. Uh, in fact, what we have 
is uh, from next week at least, but probably this week as well, we have multiple studios booked. Okay, so fuzz measure is available in 44, in uh, 50A and 50B, in 88 and 89. I've asked for it to be installed here, and we actually have a few more licenses, and we are bound to have it in all rooms in 95 as well. Okay, so this will help you increasingly once you get to the, uh, the assessment, which will necessitate you to use fuzz measure. Uh, if you want to use your laptops, you can get a demo version of uh, fuzz measure, which we will talk about next week. But for now, you can use any of these rooms to generate your white noise. Okay? I will go to the guys and tell them it's part of the practical. They're not quite aware what we're exactly doing here. But also, you can stay here and use this uh, setup to generate white noise and measure three distances. So if you are uh, relying on the rule of thumb, then try to do double distance and double that distance. Okay? If you think you want to you know, fiddle with the equation, then you can do random distances and then see what, what comes out of that. Okay? And then we'll look at the results next week, beginning of practical. So that's one. Two, determine, oh sorry, three, determine the SPL drop behind an obstacle in relation to removing the obstacle. Okay, so you have a situation, you have a white noise coming out of the speaker, you put something in between the speaker and the SPL meter. Okay, and just briefly describe, <coughs> okay, this is about the distance that we have, this is the kind of obstacle we put in between, and then we can compare these things next week. Okay, this also is already on Blackboard. This is the last slide of the slideshow as well if you want to have a reference and then finally determine the maximum and average SPL of three rather different environments okay it's up to you maybe you can go to the fridge for a very silent one we have a people building work here if you want to walk to the highway that's cool as well you can go to the cafeteria have some fun walk around okay the thing there is to realize that the SPL meter has uh, way of recording maximum SPL okay so it, it has a maximum hold button so if you do that now one of the things that you will discover in terms of measuring uh, environments is that you may not be significantly close to any sound source within the environment okay so if I want to say okay well an average SPL of a lecture like this is 60 dB that is the case if you are set there but if you bring the SPL meter close to my mouth it's gonna blow up metaphorically speaking okay so that's your p uh, opportunity to first of all figure out what would be the position where you're not influenced by a direct sound source and you can actually estimate the environment okay and also in terms of the average so I'll trust you to kind of keep reading it, have some fun, note down a few values, say, oh, it's about 55, it's about 70, it's about the rest of it. If you're doing this, I advise you to try and find different spaces because then it's going to be more informative in terms of what we do. Okay? Any questions? Cool. So you can grab the kids, get into groups, write your name, one name <laughs> per kid. Uh, in the meanwhile, I am in 2M51. Okay, so if there's any questions, you can come up there, ask me, and uh, that should be that. All right, have some fun. Zach, I want to ask you, um, yes. for next week, is it possible to do the practicals as like, soon as we finish the lecture, maybe? Because I'm just walking in I, I was thinking, because, but you're not an APP. No. But are there many people who are not an APP? I don't think so. I know quite a few of us that are only a few, yeah. Who is not in APP? What? Anyone who's not? Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I guess it's just the two of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's a problem. I, I I was thinking to do this, but then Luke told me, listen, it's about sixty-five people in APP, so right. everyone pretty much. Right. And uh, but for us, like, it's not doable, basically. Well, you could. Would like you just to? borrow yeah. the yeah, borrow the equipment. It'd be great. And It'd be great yeah. to do it right after the lecture. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. The, the the only issue with that is that 
you know, we are supposed to discuss last week's things together. Ah. So I'll have to ask you. I mean, if it was more people and kind of, okay, who wants to stay in on a Friday afternoon, I, I would have probably made the effort, but we just don't get the chance to reflect all together on, on the findings. So I'll ask you to uh, have, have a break and then start with one, okay? Okay. Cool. Four kids, four people. You can return it when you're done. That's all good. Goodbye to the video.